On the Method of Grace by George Whitfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T. Wellington. On the Method of Grace. As God can send a nation or people no greater blessing than to give them faithful, sincere, and upright ministers, so the greatest curse that God can possibly send upon a people in this world is to give them over to blind, unregenerate, carnal, lukewarm, and unskillful guides. And yet in all ages we find that there have been many wolves in sheep's clothing, many that daubed their untempered mortar, that prophesied smoother things than God did allow. As it was formerly, so it is now. There are many that corrupt the word of God and deal deceitfully with it. It is so in a special manner in the prophet Jeremiah's time. And he, faithful to his Lord, faithful to that God who empowered him, did not fail from time to time to open his mouth against them, and to bear a noble testimony to the honor of that God in whose name he from time to time spake. If you will read his prophecy, you will find that none spake more against such ministers than Jeremiah. In the words of the text, in a more special manner, he exemplifies how they had dealt falsely, how they had behaved treacherously to poor souls. Says he, They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. The prophet, in the name of God, had been denouncing war against the people. He had been telling them that their house should be left desolate, and that the Lord would certainly visit the land with war. Therefore, says he in the eleventh verse, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days. And their houses shall be turned unto others, with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. The prophet gives a thundering message, that they might be terrified and have some convictions and inclinations to repent. But it seems that the false prophets, that the false priests, went about stifling people's convictions, and when they were hurt or a little terrified, they were for daubing them over the wound, telling them that Jeremiah was but an enthusiastic preacher, that there could be no such thing as war among them, and saying to people, Peace, peace, be still when the prophet told them there was no peace. How many of us cry, Peace, peace, to our souls, when there is no peace? How many are there who are now settled upon their lees, that now think they are Christians, that now flatter themselves that they have an interest in Jesus Christ? Whereas, if we come to examine their experiences, we shall find that their peace is but a peace of the devil's making, it is not a peace of God's giving. It is not a peace that passes human understanding. It is a matter, therefore, of great importance, my dear hearers, to know whether we may speak peace to our hearts. We are all desirous of peace. Peace is an unspeakable blessing. But how can we live without peace? And therefore, people from time to time must be taught how far they must go and what must be wrought in them before they can speak peace to their hearts. This is what I design at present, that I may deliver my soul, that I may be free from the blood of all those to whom I preach, that I may not fail to declare the whole counsel of God. I shall, from the words of the text, endeavor to show you what you must undergo and what must be wrought in you before you can speak peace to your hearts. But before I come directly to this, give me leave to premise a caution or two. And the first is that I take it for granted you believe religion to be an inward thing. You believe it to be a work in the heart, a work wrought in the soul by the power of the Spirit of God. If you do not believe this, you do not believe your Bibles. If you do not believe this, though you have got your Bibles in your hand, you hate the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. For religion is everywhere represented in Scripture as the work of God in the heart. The kingdom of God is within us, says our Lord. And he is not a Christian who is one outwardly, but he is a Christian who is one inwardly. If any of you place religion in outward things, I shall not perhaps please you this morning. 
You will understand me no more when I speak of the work of God upon a poor sinner's heart than if I were talking in an unknown tongue. First then, before you can speak peace to your hearts, you must be made to see, made to feel, made to weep over, made to bewail your actual transgressions against the law of God. According to the covenant of works, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Cursed is that man, be he what he may, be he who he may, that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. We are not only to do some things, but we are to do all things, and we are to continue so to do, so that the least deviation from the moral law, according to the covenant of works, whether in thought, word, or deed, deserves eternal death at the hand of God. And if one evil thought, if one evil word, if one evil action deserves eternal damnation, how many hells, my friends, do every one of us deserve? whose whole lives have been one continued rebellion against God. Before ever, therefore, you can speak peace to your hearts, you must be brought to see, brought to believe, what a dreadful thing it is to depart from the living God. And now, my dear friends, examine your hearts, for I hope you come hither with a design to have your souls made better. Give me leave to ask you, in the presence of God, whether you know the time, and if you do not know exactly the time, do you know there was a time when God wrote bitter things against you, when the arrows of the Almighty were within you? Was ever the remembrance of your sins grievous to you? Was the burden of your sins intolerable to your thoughts? Did you ever see that God's wrath might justly fall upon you on account of your actual transgressions against God? Were you ever in all your life sorry for your sins? Could you ever say, my sins are gone over my head as a burden too heavy for me to bear. Did you ever experience any such thing as this? Did ever any such thing as this pass between you and your soul? If not, for Jesus Christ's sake, do not call yourselves Christians. You may speak peace to your hearts, but there is no peace. May the Lord awaken you. May the Lord convert you. May the Lord give you peace, if it be His will, before you go home. Did you ever feel and experience this, any of you, to justify God in your damnation, to own that you are by nature children of wrath, and that God can justly cut you off, though you never actually had offended Him in all your life? If you were ever truly convicted, if your hearts were ever truly cut, if self were truly taken out of you, you would be made to see and feel this. And if you have never felt the weight of original sin, do not call yourselves Christians. I am verily persuaded original sin is the greatest burden of a true convert. This ever grieves the regenerate soul, the sanctified soul. The indwelling of sin in the heart is the burden of a converted person. It is the burden of a true Christian. He continually cries out, Oh, who will deliver me from this body of death, this indwelling corruption in my heart? This is that which disturbs a poor soul most. And therefore, if you never felt this inward corruption, if you never saw that God might justly curse you for it, indeed, my dear friends, you may speak peace to your hearts, but I fear, nay, I know, there is no true peace. After we are renewed, yet we are renewed but in part, indwelling sin continues in us. There is a mixture of corruption in every one of our duties so that after we are converted, were Jesus Christ only to accept us according to our works, our works would damn us. For we cannot put up a prayer, but it is far from the perfection which the moral law requireth. I do not know what you may think, but I can say that I cannot pray, but I sin. I cannot preach to you or to any others, but I sin. I can do nothing without sin, as one expresseth it. My repentance wants to be repented of, and my tears to be washed in the precious blood of my dear Redeemer. Our best duties are as so many splendid sins. Before you can speak peace to your heart, you must not only be sick of your original and actual sin, but you must be made sick of your righteousness, of all your duties and performances. There must be a deep conviction before you can be brought out of your own self-righteousness, it is the last idol taken out of our heart. The pride of our heart will not let us submit to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
But if you never felt that you had no righteousness of your own, if you never felt the deficiency of your own righteousness, you cannot come to Jesus Christ. But then, before you can speak peace to your souls, there is one particular sin you must be greatly troubled for, and yet I fear there are few of you who think what it is. It is the reigning, the damning sin of the Christian world, and yet the Christian world seldom or never think of it. And pray, what is that? It is what most of you think you are not guilty of, and that is the sin of unbelief. Before you can speak peace to your heart, you must be troubled for the unbelief of your heart. But can it be supposed that any of you are unbelievers here in this churchyard, that are born in Scotland, in a Reformed country, that go to church every Sabbath? Can any of you that receive the sacrament once a year, oh, that it were administered oftener, can it be supposed that you who had tokens for the sacrament, that you who keep up family prayer, that any of you do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, we mistake a historical faith for a true faith, wrought in the heart of the Spirit of God. You fancy you believe because you believe there is such a book as we call the Bible, because you go to church. All this you may do and have no true faith in Christ. Merely to believe there was such a person as Christ, merely to believe there is a book called the Bible, will do you no good, more than to believe there was such a man as Caesar or Alexander the Great. The Bible is a sacred depository. What thanks have we to give to God for these lively oracles? But ye may have these and not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. My dear friends, there must be a principle wrought in the heart by the Spirit of the living God. Did I ask you how long it is since you believed in Jesus Christ? I suppose most of you would tell me you believed in Jesus Christ as long as ever you remember. You never did misbelieve. Then you could not give me a better proof that you never yet believed in Jesus Christ, unless you were sanctified early, as from the womb. For they that otherwise believe in Christ know there was a time when they did not believe in Jesus Christ. You say you love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. If I were to ask you how long it is since you loved God, you would say, as long as you can remember. You never hated God. You know no time when there was enmity in your heart against God. Then, unless you were sanctified very early, you never loved God in your life. My dear friends, I am more particular in this, because it is a most deceitful delusion, whereby so many people are carried away that they believe already. Therefore, it is remarked of Mr. Marshall, giving account of his experiences, that he had been working for life, and he had ranged all his sins under the Ten Commandments, and then, coming to a minister, asked him the reason why he could not get peace. The minister looked to his catalog. Away, says he, I do not find one word of sin or unbelief in all your catalog. It is the peculiar work of the Spirit of God to convince us of our unbelief that we have got no faith. Says Jesus Christ, I will send the Comforter, and when he comes, he will reprove the world of the sin of unbelief. Of sin, says Christ, because they believe not on me. I am now talking of the invisible realities of another world, of inward religion, of the work of God upon a poor sinner's heart. I am now talking of a matter of great importance, my dear hearers, you are all concerned in it. Your souls are concerned in it. Your eternal salvation is concerned in it. You may be at peace, but perhaps the devil has lulled you asleep into a carnal lethargy and security, and will endeavor to keep you there till he get you to hell. And there you will be awakened. But it will be dreadful to be awakened and find yourself so fearfully mistaken when the great gulf is fixed when you will be calling to all eternity for a drop of water to cool your tongue and shall not obtain it. End of On the Method of Grace This is in the public domain.